A radical look at Scottish history with Stuart McHardy. Part 3. Tribal Scotland. The first written references to events in this part of the world come from Roman sources. I've already made mention of how central classical learning has been in the development of European culture, and this creates certain problems. It is never a good idea to try and build a picture of the past from any single source, but all our early sources are Roman, and they are written from a particular standpoint. The first mention comes in the work written in praise of the Roman general Agricola, and was penned by his son-in-law Tacitus. It's not an attempt at an objective or even balanced presentation of what happened in Scotland around the year 80, but a work of praise to honour the writer's late father-in-law and is not in any way an eyewitness account. In it, the Romans are said to have had a great victory over the combined tribes of the Caledonians, and Tacitus puts the enemy casualties at 10,000 while claiming 360 casualties on the Roman side. Now, this seems unlikely, even given the organisation of the Roman legions as ruthless killing machines and the tribal practice of fighting battles one-on-one. -on -one. As yet, no proof that the battle was ever fought has been found, though many have tried to locate it in different parts of Scotland on the assumption that it must have happened. When you compare the account of this, the Battle of Mons Gropius, as it has become known, with what was written by another Roman, like Tacitus writing far away in Rome itself, later, in the year 217, we see a slightly different picture. Dio, writing of the campaigns of Septimus Severus, says the Romans lost 50,000 men. It is as yet unclear whether he is referring to all Roman casualties since their first incursion into Scotland over a century earlier, or losses in the Severan campaigns which has lasted several years. Either way, it's a considerable number of casualties and certainly shows that the Romans were keen to conquer the northern half of Great Britain. Now much has been written of the Roman occupation of that part of Scotland south of the Fourth Clyde Line, but I find the idea of a Roman province here unlikely. The longest period the Romans were in Scotland was while man in the Antonine Wall, which ran from the Fourth to the Clyde. It was started in the early 140s and abandoned in the mid-160s. It seems likely that its occupation was not constant through that period. Outside of the wall itself and the Roman forts which form lines of supply to the wall are ports like Cramond on the 4th to allow supply by sea. There is little evidence of Roman settlement here. What the picture does suggest is a relatively short-term military occupation as part of continued attempts to conquer the tribes here. Attempts which all ultimately failed. Yet some historians want the Romans to have been successful no matter the evidence. This may be related to the fact that south of Hadrian's Wall, running from the Solway Firth to the mouth of the River Tyne, England was part of the Roman Empire for 400 years. During that time there were several uprisings against the invaders, but all were suppressed. The Romans played a very important part in the history of England. In Scotland, not so much. Roman sources do tell us something of the indigenous people, however. Dio Cassi even referring to their form of rule being democratic for the most part. What is clear is that Scotland at the time was occupied by tribal warrior societies, and Dio even gives a description of their fighting tactics, which sounds suspiciously like modern guerrilla warfare. This would make sense in societies where inter-tribal cattle raiding was endemic and carried out by fast-moving, lightly armed warrior bands. This type of ongoing battle is common in cattle rearing societies across the world, and we have evidence of it still happening in Scotland into the 18th century. Seems also that the lads in the heather, those Jacobite troops who kept up a low-level guerrilla campaign against the British army in the Highlands after Culloden, used skills learned in such traditions. 
and this is a period of our history which is now in the process of becoming clearer. Now the tribal warriors fighting the Romans may have been likely armed, but their refusal to be conquered had led to the creations of Hadrian's Wall as early as the 120s, and it was only abandoned when the Romans left Britain in the early 5th century. Throughout that period, the threat from the north was apparently constant. In 367, there was a major incursion when northern warriors overwhelmed Hadrian's Wall and penetrated deep into England before returning home with their spoils. Both Scots and Picts were involved, along with a still mysterious group known as the Atticotti, as well as Germanic tribes who attacked both England and Gaul, suggesting considerable ongoing contact between the peoples of Scotland and Northern Europe. This series of raids is known these days as the Great Conspiracy, a decidedly Romanised way of looking at it. The first individual we hear of in what is now Scotland is Kilgacus, who supposedly led the Allied Caledonian troops at the putative Battle of Mons Gropius, and it is worth noticing that though Tacitus refers to him as a man of valour and nobility, he is not given any title. Did the assembled tribes choose their most able warrior as their leader? It is at least possible. What do the Romans tell us of the peoples here? We can be certain that they did not give us the name Pict, a term which was used interchangeably with Caledonians over time to represent all of the northern tribes. The name is probably based on an indigenous form like Pecht, which is what the common folk of Scotland were still calling them into the 19th century. Tattooing was common in the world at the time, and the notion of the name coming from the Latin Picti is just one more example of their apparent sad need to big up the Romans. We have a list of tribal names from the 2nd century geographer Ptolemy, who, like so many Roman commentators, was never here. Some of the names he gives us, like Caledonian, have survived, and the Selgovi, who locates in the border area, may have left their name in Selkirk. Many others seem to have disappeared into the mists of time, with a couple of notable exceptions. There's the Gododin of Lodian, who were known as Votidini to the Romans. But in 1715, when the brother of the Duke Argyle was raising troops for the government to resist the Jacobite uprising, he was in need of horses. He was based in Inveraria and Argyle, and he sent to the Mull of Kintyre for 200 horses. The horses came in the care of a group of men from the McEachern clan. McEachern, from the Gaelic Ech, a horse, can be translated as son of the horseman. Ptolemy had written on his map that the people of Kintyre were known as the Epidae, the horse people. In the 18th century, up till the Battle of Culloden, much of the highlands of Scotland were still essentially tribal, and though the clan system was beginning to weaken, it was not till the campaign of ethnic cleansing that took place directly after that tragic battle that it went into terminal decline. In Roman times and after, the people of Scotland were apparently grouped into what appears to have been a series of tribal confederations. The Gododin, whose area stretched down the east coast as far as the Tweed, possibly further. The Britons of Strathclyde, whose area of influence stretched down to Hadrian's Wall in the west. The Picts in the east, the north, and the Northern Isles, and in the west, the Scots of Dalriada. Now, the idea that the Scots came from Ireland in the year 500 is based on a single entry in a book by English monk Bede, and there's no historical, linguistic, or archaeological evidence to support it. Point to which we may well return. All of these peoples basically were cattle-rearing, tribal warrior societies, the main difference between the Scots and the rest being that they spoke an early form of Gaelic, while the rest spoke ancient Brythonic, a language related to Welsh. What is clear is that the tribal makeup of Scotland lasted a very long time. The borders were only brought under centralised control in the 15th century, and the highlands remained tribal to the middle of the 18th century. And, in the Declaration of 1320, it says... If good King Robert does not keep the English out, we will make ourselves another king. And this seems a strong echo of the well-attested tribal and Scottish clan practice of replacing a chief who is considered 
not up to the job. So taps, in terms of our history, we would be better looking at kinship rather than kingship. The next time we will look closer at some of the peoples of Scotland. More information and reading lists can be found at www.stuartmcardy.wordpress.com.